By the time Snatch came, I had zero anxiety about making a film. Five, four, three, two, one, turn over. Well, let's not stand on ceremony, mate. Let's start the show. Matthew was a bit alarmed by my lack of anxiety. And there was lots of booby traps. Finally, the system just turned into a hoax. We good? Do I look tidy? So I watched Snatch uh, last night for the first time. I, I suspected about 15 years. It might even be longer, actually. And yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was surprised, actually. I'm surprised. <laughs> I was surprised because it tickled me and I was surprised how much it tickled me. Look, 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 dog, look. <laughs> look at the dog. <laughs> well, actually I got offered a lot of films after, after uh, Lockstock and I, and I, I think uh, uh, Snatch was sort of all the other stories that I couldn't fit in Lockstock. So I felt confident because that was received well that I, I could have another stab at that genre, whatever that genre was. I knew what I was doing there, and I felt second time round I, I would be more confident. Although we were being offered sort of formidable uh, uh, Hollywood um, big budget movies, um, I didn't want to do those uh, in part out of intelligence and in part out of fear. So I stuck to uh, Snatch, which took me three months to write with the, as I said, the, what was left in the tank of the sort of Lockstock days. And I wrote it actually just down the road from here. And I wrote it in three months. Jesus. I have spectacular dyslexia. Um, so, and I, I probably write three hours a day on average, uh, different things. And my writing, my, my spelling hasn't improved since I was 12. I know it's not gonna improve, but there are some people that think that it's an unconscious addiction. Um, to looking like you can't spell. So, yeah, uh, Lockstock was, I, I wrote on napkins and so on. And then eventually I wrote it in one of those, uh, those sort of maths books, you know, it had lots of lines on it. And I sort of spent a good deal of time sort of doing it in longhand. And then I, I, I knew some clever so-and-so that actually put it in script format. And after that, then I got quite good on the, yeah, well, ooh. and I, Mavis Beavis teaches typing is what taught me how to type. Actually, I type rather type rather well. Although I spell very badly, I can I can belt words out without looking at the computers. That's sort of one of those things I'm quite uh, quite smug about is that I can actually type. So yeah, I didn't. I, I wasn't really interested in anything else, and I suppose I, I was just focused on snatch because I just thought just keep your eyes on the prize there. You know what you're doing there. So just just focus on that. And I'd seen other filmmakers actually, and filmmakers I can mention, and I'm not going to do, but other, other filmmakers that just came before me and I saw them bite off more than they can chew and I thought they're pretty capable, these guys. And I saw them, I was thinking, oh, well, no, they're, they're strange decisions. They're, they're bold and amb ambitious decisions, but they fell out of the world that they were familiar and confident within. So I was, I think I was probably nervous of, um, intelligently so, by the way, uh, intelligently nervous and cautious about trying to bite off more than I can chew and not really be thorough at understanding different genres. So we got offered things that actually were sort of in my in my wheelhouse, but much bigger budgets. You know, we were working lots of a million, stats was 10 million. Um, and I didn't know what to do with 100 million. And I didn't really want to know what to do with 100 million. I wanted to sort of find my way. Um, so yeah, I just didn't want to bite off more than I could chew. So the, the writing of Snatch and Lockstock actually was really, there were a, a series of different stories, uh, f folk, sort of loric pub speak that you, I picked up in gyms and pubs and whatnot. Interesting little narratives uh, about idiosyncratic characters that managed to capture your imagination and you were interested in the subculture of these characters, which I felt was never sort of expressed in any format that I was familiar with. I thought, what I'll do is I'll, it, I'll tell a writer these tales and then they'll write these tales for me and then we'll go make a film because principally I wanted to be a director, not a writer. I would end up writing scenes and presenting them to writers to rewrite. Uh, and then the writers lost interest actually in that process. And then since I couldn't find another writer, I just went, oh, fuck it. 
let's take all my notes and cobble that into a script. So yeah, it was sort of the, the Loric tradition of gathering sort of uh, urban legends, put them all in one part. And then when I found these little, interesting little tales that I'd heard around pub tables and so on, I would try and find a way of uh, fusing them together uh, in order to give it some kind of narrative, uh, a beginning, a middle and an end. So they were really sort of all, they were a selection of short stories I had heard around pubs really. Matthew and I, uh, we, we met before Lockstock and then he, I found him to be mutually as motivated as I was to get into the industry. He was very aggressive, I was very aggressive and uh, you know we had the door slammed in our face as, as by the way I think people should do. Uh, and if you haven't got a key and if you can't if you can't kick the door in, you, you have to find a way of getting into the building one way or the other. And I felt as though Matthew was as equally as motivated as I was as to get into the building. And he was just going to get in through the chimney, into the basement, come in a suitcase, whatever it was going to be. Uh, he and I were going to make sure that we got into that building. And he was the only other guy that I met that was, was as motivated as me as to break into the building of filmmaking, as it were. So yeah, we were great mates. We did sort of did everything together. Still good mates, still very good mates. Matthew was backing me in terms of the, the first one seemed to work, so I'll back him on the second one. There was a bit of finger wagging when it came to the second one because he thought I wasn't taking the job very seriously. On Lockstock, I didn't sleep at all. You know, when a car came to pick you up in the morning, I was waiting with notes and storyboards. By the time Snatch came around, yeah, I was oversleeping. And I was surprised with the lack of anxiety that I had about making Snatch. By the time Snatch came, I had zero anxiety about making a film. And Matthew was a bit alarmed by my lack of anxiety on the second movie. So he sent me a very stern note, which I've got somewhere actually, about how I need to take this more seriously. I found that very funny. I didn't take that note very seriously at all. Um, and. Yeah, I was just sort of, by the time it came out at number two, I just, I just felt as though I knew what I was doing. Matt Vaughan, who produced this whole paraphernalia, said that this time there'd be proper trailers, proper food, proper, you know, proper conditions, lobster thermidor at lunch. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Potato sandwiches, man, if we were lucky. Am I right? If we're lucky. Do you think that's worthy of giving us economy biscuits to eat <laughs> while we're working for you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, yeah? You, no one complained apart from you. That's not strictly true, actually, Matt. I was asking. Everyone could play. <laughs> Would someone mind telling me? Who are you? I was directing Jason last night from my living room while he's 6,000 miles away in Los Angeles. And uh, we were commenting on how we think Jason hasn't aged a day, actually, since then. Most people think he looks better. Watching Jason now, watching him then, directing him now, directing him then. And I, by the way, his performance in that, uh, in Snatch, is like really good. By the way, I just watched Snatch. <laughs> you made that. Uh, hold on, where was the last time you saw Snatch? 20 years ago. Uh, uh, Jay, I tell you, fucking watch it again. Your performance in it is fucking spectacular. Uh, I haven't seen it for a long time. Have a, have a look. Really dry, really confident. And I think what it was is there was a, a, a conspiracy of positive enthusiasm from everyone that was involved in Lockstock. So, uh, drunk on the fumes on Lockstock, we sort of went to war uh, with Snatch. I mean, part I wrote that, that character because, uh, with Jason in mind, I think. Um, and the Stevie Graham. Well, We're going to get right the way back Divi there, Tommy a new gun. Please, Tommy's please, getting a gun. Please. I met Stevie, um, on the, I made a short film called The Hard Case, and a taxi turned up, and the, an actor got out the back, and Stevie happened to be in a car. I thought Stevie was driving a car. I think Stevie was his mate. And Stevie got out of the car and he was Liverpudlian. I saw he had all that scalps thing going on. And then he started taking the mickey out of some of our actors that were in this short film that I made for five grand. And he saw his Cockney accent was like spectacular. And his, to try and do an authentic London accent is almost impossible if you're not from London. And then I said, could do that again. And then Stevie had, yeah, I could conjure up any accent. And so I went, I ignored the mate that he came with for the job, 
we relegated him and put Stevie in, who I thought was the minicab driver. <laughs> Why me? Well, you know about caravans. How's that? You spent a summer in one. Oh, and Brad Pitt, when we went to Los Angeles on Lockstock, I got a call from Brad, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt's agent, saying, Brad would like to meet you, he likes Lockstock. And uh, I couldn't think of a bigger, more impressive movie star to me than Brad Pitt. And, you know, as soon as I met him, I, I thought, well, I've got, I mean, if he wants to be in my next movie, he's got to be in my next movie. I actually called up a guy to have a, have a chat with, so there's anything in the future. And I said, well, as it happens, Brad, we do have something in the future. We were thinking, God, there's nothing in it for him, and fucking hell, we've got Brad Pitt saying he wants to work with us. And the guy came up with the idea of him playing the Irish gentleman who lives in the caravan. Mickey! I wanted Brad to play the traveller. So I took my uh, shirt off and I was sort of running around the gaff with my, f with my fists out, trying to do the best impression I could of what I thought uh, that character would look like. Anyway, he signed up for it. He went, all right, I'll, I'll give that a crack. He got accent coaches and all of that. I had to tell you, and it, we were, we were, it was becoming a bit dry. And, uh, and the day before I said, he wasn't very happy with his accent, I wasn't very happy with his accent. I said, I think we sort of, we should have a bit more fun with this. And then I sort of did the role again, and then Matt Vaughan and myself, the idea was to inspire Brad to uh, take on this role. And it had the reverse effect. He just went, fuck it, you do it. You're really good at it, you do it, you be the guy. Uh, and then Vaughan and I were paranoid for the duration of the, of the film that Pitt was just going to go, now nah, you're all right, mate, you crack on. Because no one could understand a word that he was saying. And uh, Sony was the studio at the time. They, that was the, pr their principal concern was, you know, they had Brad Pitt in the movie and the, no one could understand a word that he was saying. Do you like dags? Dags. What? Yeah, dags. Dags? Do you like dags? Oh, dogs. Sure. I like dags. Pitt's hands started running into trouble because the chap he was fighting used to be a sparring partner of Mike Tyson's and he kept hitting his elbows. Um, there's only so many times you can hit someone's elbows before you can't move your hands anymore. And I think that was our principal concern was how we could present, because Brad was all like hot and ready to go. And it was all quite visceral, that stuff. I and mean, Pitt did not mind taking a kicking. And uh, he didn't mind giving the other chap a kicking. It was all a question of preserving his mitts. Benicio del Toro, we had Benicio del Toro. Uh, he was also pretty hot back then, Usual Suspects at the back. Well, I was a big fan of Usual Suspects. Big fan of him in that. Uh, again, you couldn't understand much of what he was saying in that. Who else did we have? We had uh, Dennis Farina. Dennis was lovely. I was a big fan of Dennis Farina. Can't get any better than that. No, sir, not me. How was it for camera? Good? Yeah, good. No hairs on the gate? Just move on. So anything that I could do. Dennis Farina I was, uh, I was into. I mean, there was a sort of wish list of, uh, of stars that uh, I was interested in. Do one more, bit. Abby, do up your shoelaces. Abby, do up your shoelaces! <laughs> Tony Jones was, for, for Jason Statham and myself, um, he was like a sort of older brother to us, and Jason and I had no money. I got paid 8,000 pounds to direct Lockstock, um, which was, uh, for me, a very impressive amount of money at the time. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I ever got paid that £8,000, incidentally. But yeah, after Lockstock then, so I didn't really have any money. You know, on your first film, you still, you, you still don't have any dough. And then when we went to Los Angeles first time round, we, we weren't on anyone's dime, we were on our own dime. So we all flew economy and we had to try and find accommodation when we got to Los Angeles. And the only person that had any money was Vinny. He said, well, why don't you stay at mine? And I was only there for a couple of days, and Vinny said, look, you take that bed. I said, but Vinny, that's your bed. And he went, uh, no, no, I've got another room next door. So, you know, I tucked down there and woke up in the morning, walked into the room next door, and Vinny was on the couch. There are infinite examples of Vinny Jones's generosity towards Jason and myself. He'd always lend you cars. He'd always say, look, here's a bit of money if you're taking someone out on a date. If you try to give him the money back, he'd never accept the money back. It was endless, endless examples of his unmitigated generosity to us when, particularly in a time when we needed it. Uh, I always thought Vinny Jones would be a movie star ever since I was seeing, uh, saw him on the football pitch. Um, and then I watched a sort of documentary on Vinnie Jones and that fascinated me even more. It was like he was into fly fishing and sort of esoteric kind of the natural esoteric world. And I thought, hold on, how does this all work? I thought he looked spectacular, he was a great athlete. So as soon as we 
make Lockstock. I was desperate to turn him into a... I always thought Vinnie Jones would be a film star. Fuck <laughs> off, Jones! Say what's in the script! So this dog knows we're mucking about. It's not going to try and bite anyone, is it? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> into my phone. Look. Fuck you. That's a good job that was there. Yeah, so we had uh, Lenny, Robbie G. Funny watching Robbie G last night. I mean, Robbie G, first, firstly, has a brilliant accent. He has a brilliant voice and a brilliant delivery. Uh, I think that's when I already first started laughing in the movie yesterday. No, don't move it now. <laughs> Otherwise, people will see the damage. <laughs> What'd you do that for? I didn't see it there. It's a four-ton truck, Tyrone. <laughs> it's not as though it's a packet of fucking peanuts, is it? It was a funny angle. Addy is an old friend of mine. Addy I met in uh, a paint shop back in probably 92, I should think. I had a flat in Fulham and Addy worked in a paint shop down the road. And I thought, again, he was like a character like Vinny. I thought, whoever that guy is, uh, if I ever make a movie, I'm going to put that guy in a movie. <laughs> All I saw was this little todger gun like this. Yeah. <laughs> and Lenny, Lenny was quite a sort of big deal. He's got a pretty sort of kind of respected actor back then and still is. Um, so, yeah, there were those three chaps. Tyrone, what have you done? Yeah, Tyrone, what have you done? I always thought Mike Reed had this, that, that voice, which people don't seem to have those voices anymore. And that I, I sort of grew up th uh, being impressed with that sort of deep cockney husky voice, which uh, yeah, very f people just don't seem to have any more. Heavy, heavy. You've got to understand, this ain't exactly Vegas, and this ain't exactly legal. Which I always found, I was very impressionable to that, to that sound, because it was like, where did that come from? Uh, that, that accent and that, uh, that timber, the cadence in his voice, it, it just, it's, it represents a spirit of London. Yeah, so Mike Reed I really wanted because Mike Reed had a great voice. Um, Alan Ford, also had a great voice, actually. Great teeth, great eyes. Pull your tongue out of my arsehole, Gary. So I chose them primarily, I think, on their voice. And I, even I'm in the film, actually. That's me! Hey! Go on, son. So I'm in the pub there reading. And actually, I think what it was is I, was, I started off directing from that position. I, I may have had a small monitor, actually, underneath the newspaper. I said, I'll just leave me here. Shot. When we first started making music videos, uh, music videos and short films and commercials, I found the most efficient way of making sure things got done was to find people. It was a humorous kind of idea and keep the sort of uh, a jolly spirit to keeping everyone motivated and focused. I'm going to find you every day that you don't have a sheet of fines. Fine. Okay? Yeah. £10 a day. Aye. Aye. Right. <laughs> Do you get £10 a day? <laughs> so I would charge people if they didn't meet their deadlines a five or a ten or a, and that took on a momentum and it also made the day fun uh, and by the way we still have a fining system uh, that occasionally pops up on on uh, in different productions now and then it became a game because you know if you were caught with a phone on set uh, and if your phone went off on set then you really ended up in trouble so people were slipping phones into people's pockets and course calling them and that sort of nonsense. Oh. So sorry. I fucking feel terrible. Fine. That is that is a fine. What's your name? Oh, is it red or yellow? It's a yellow. It's a yellow. Stay. Hang on, look at my chair. Not Mary. That's my. I imagine in the end the finding system turned against me in the end. So no matter how much I find people, then they, I found that they started applying the same rules to me. So uh, and there was lots of booby traps. But in the end, yeah, the finding finding system just turned into a, it was a hoax. Uh, and a reason to have a laugh. Let's have a look at what? Your mobile phone. What mobile phone? <laughs> two in position. <laughs> uh, two. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the fine was. What was the fine? It was a plant. It, it was a plant. What's a fine well before rehearsal was undertaken? So that's sixteen pounds. I fucking hate you. This is the scene of the opening montage of the film. Line by line, we have the entire movie drawn. 
So when we're on set, we know what we're doing. It takes us almost as long to draw it as it does to yeah. shoot it. In that opening sequence, there's half my cast is in that opening sequence. But I think that was informed by sort of music videos or whatever I was making at the time. Uh, how, do you, how do you take creatively, how do you go from one uh, introduction of one character to another one in, a, in an interesting creative fashion? I was influenced by The Wild Bunch and the credit sequence in The Wild Bunch. They had freeze frames in that and the freeze frames become very unfashionable. But I, what I liked about those westerns is, um, or westerns in general of a certain period, uh, of Sam Peckinpah, is he'd embrace the film itself. So it, it, film itself has, uh, if people wish to dial into this, film itself has its own language. Someone like Peckinpah seemed to celebrate in the texture of film. I wanted to sort of hark back to some of those filmmakers that had made an impression on me. There was a, there was a, a, a very good commercials director called Jonathan Glazer, and he made a video um, using a camera called Photosonics for Radiohead. And I remember when I saw that, black and white, and a chair falling backwards, and he ramped, speed ramped within that music video. I thought, I'm going to use that in a movie. What I wanted to do was to use the, the textural nature of film itself within the film. So I wanted the film to be a character. So hence there was a lot of freeze frames, uh, speed ramps, and anything else that I could do to express the nature of celluloid. And to see that in the first time in narrative, uh, in film, to me was, you know, a historical moment within film, as it was a historical moment within music videos or, or commercials. I also made my mind up quite early on that there was, I was making a decision to be very anti-English in a traditional sense, but, although oddly, as an older man, I, I love English costume dramas. When I was 28 years old, when I was making Snatch, and also I was determined to be the antithesis of that English voice. What I wanted was a completely different English voice than what you know the world was sort of recognizing us creatively in the world of film at that period sort of through costume dramas. One of the other things about costume dramas is they really took their time over certain sequences. Um, and I wanted to break the tradition of taking time. I just okay, all I care about is how do we get from A to B in the most efficient fashion possible? So we ended up with. Do you hear that, Doug? I'm, I'm coming, coming to London. London. <laughs> Shut up and sit down, you big bald fuck. All the tunes in uh, both Lockstock and all the tunes in Snatch. Uh, came from pubs and they were all my favourite tunes from jukeboxes from 1985 up to uh, 1998. So when I was writing I'd never think about you know what music's going to go with what and afterwards I'd go to my roller decks of favourite pub tunes from jukeboxes and go oh let's try this let's try that uh, you know and then you know that could dictate the tonality of the scene uh, simply because th these were tunes that sort of meant a lot to me. And they were tunes like Golden Brown by The Stranglers. Golden brown, texture like sun, lays me down with my mind she runs. Ghost Town by The Specials. Give me the case. Fuck you. Shoot me. Oasis, yeah, uh, fucking in the bushes. <laughs> That album Mezzanine by Massive Attack, that must have come out, what, 96 or something like that? And that had a big impact on me. And they would just choose that. I just found myself listening to it again and again and again. They, really, they, just, they just meant something to me at that, at that time. Oh, I love this track. One of the things that I do lament is I feel as though I, I, I sort of wish that I'd made a, a follow-up to Snatch. Um, but I was, I was so distracted by other things in my life at that time that I just, I, I didn't know what was up and what was down. But, you know, if I, if I was in that position now, knowing what I know now, I probably would have made three of those. 
If, if I sat down and thought about it now for 15 minutes, I could, uh, you know, I mean, Brad Pitt became Tyson Fury. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it wouldn't take me too long to piece together where all those characters are now. What's happening with those sausages, Charlie? Th those sausages will be ready soon. Five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>